bids and boutiques seem to be trying to solve essentially the same problem, but maybe that's just my misunderstanding of some of their pieces. So I'm curious, maybe if there's at least two of you could speak to that. Maybe someone else can. Uh, I was thinking initially of a question for Tristan, but maybe JB has also something to say. So they are, they are similar in philosophy, but they target different objects. Bits is really to structure your data, and boutiques is to describe your applications, the, the programs. So they are complementary, but they are, there is no real overlap between them. Uh, nothing to add to that. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, uh, it's a, uh, as far as I understand boutique, it's really like uh, you're describing what the input and output of, of, of those things. And bit is really describing the data. So it's uh, you know, what kind of data and how do I call them, you know, different objects. Thank you. There was a question there that we had to, to cut off at the beginning. Do you want to follow up with that question? <coughs> Okay, thank you for um, As you said, you applied uh, this model uh, to for this uh, sparse network. But as we know, many uh, right now many computational model is quite complicated. And uh, consider uh, the model is com complicated and the structure is also co quite complicated, it's quite uh, heterogeneous. And in that case, we all uh, currently, if we try to do this large scale simulation, it's definitely need uh, the, uh, the network size is huge and uh, the computational burden is huge. So in that case, you think is, uh, uh, I want to know what's the key for your simulations to apply the GPU. The key ones, sorry? Uh, I mean, you did it successfully, and uh, what is experience we can learn from that? Uh, or some, like, uh, uh, this is a quite challenging, like the network is huge, and yeah. the model is huge. So you have to sacrifice some part, right, for these large scale simulations. Um, either you use a simple model, in my understanding, either you use a simple model but considering heterogeneous, or you use a homogeneous, uh, you use a complicated model but uh, homogeneous, but I'm right. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. Make it is simple. HH model is complicated com uh, compared to this uh, previous you mentioned. Like a Model, right? Yeah. So uh, for HH model, you use all to all connections. So that means homogeneous structure network. Uh, yeah. 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 But uh, uh, and uh, uh, another case, you use I can model, but uh, at that part, you use you can use a, you can apply sparse network. So yeah. that means heterogeneous structure, but a simple model. Oh, I think I see what you're saying, sorry. Um, uh, so it doesn't have to be uh, all to all. So you have a, a two-dimensional uh, conductance matrix, but not all of those need to be conducting. Some of those could be set to zero. So you don't have to have either all to all or sparse. Um, did that answer your question? Uh, um, can I comment on that? I, hi, I'm Thomas. Uh, in Buzz, well, it's just... Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Thomas Nowotny. So I, I think, I mean, it, it's been a bit longish, but, you know, back and forth, who understands what. I think the simple answer is that one was the worst case for the GPU, yeah? There was not much computation in the neuron and sparse random connections. That's the very worst you can do on the GPU. And the other one was the best you can do on the GPU, where the neurons need a lot of computation, Hodgkin Huxley, and you have connections that are quite dense and regular. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and so you see the full range here. So you see that the speed up on the worst case was two to four times, which isn't very impressive if you have 256 cores. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the other hand, if you have the best case, you have a 200 speed, um, yeah, and then that's, that looks very impressive. And we're showing these two because it's the worst case. So what you're concerned about is in the middle. Yeah. 
but we can't really right. predict how long it's going to be before you try. See. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So uh, I have a, a question for everybody um, at the more societal level, a social level, in terms of uh, replication and reproducibility, both, both of those issues. Uh, there's not a lot of incentive for the scientists to do this kind kinds of work. The agency funding agencies are not really minded to fund either replication or reproducibility, and the journals don't want to to publish papers which are second or third repeats of the same original findings. So how do we get momentum behind these very important issues when those three categories are not really that interested in, in doing this kind of work? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, I think it's a tough question because uh, it's, it's a, I think the, the momentum comes from uh, uh, when people, I mean, like for us in funding agencies, uh, could start to think, hey, you're going to do an experiment on that sort of thing, uh, and you're going to base your, your experiment on this and this and this result. Uh, we would like you to first you know, replicate that result before you do that. For instance, Nancy's chemistry lab, you know, whenever they, they start to work on, uh, you know, some uh, the, the FFA or something like that, they just do the first uh, fMRI experiment on, you know, and they, and they replicate the first thing, and then they define the FFA for that subject, and they, so they do, they do very, you know, like, they do it by, because they base their new work on, the, on, on some previous results, and so they have to do it somehow. Not everything is replicable. And and, and replicable replicability like that it's a it's a kind of a gradient of things. I mean, do you replicate with another method? Do you replicate with other data? Do you replicate with other of a you know parameterization? Like you know, it's a it's a it's a gradient of things, right? It's a, but uh, but there could be there could be in the, the funding agencies there could be the, the will to do that and also the fact that people will uh, hopefully the pre-registration will help as well. So let's say. Uh, I want to do a replication. I, I push that as a presentation, and if I don't replicate, that would be like, like you know, that that would be published. Uh, so that would be like a little bit of a, a factor of uh, dwarfing uh, effect on that. But there's no simple answer to that question. I think it's a, it's again it's a bit of a cultural change, and maybe 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 the jobs themselves could say, hey, you are basing your result on that thing, but we see that it has been only published once in uh, you know in one paper. Uh, can you know maybe you have to replicate that before you do that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's, it's a few need, ideas like that, but uh, need, uh, it's, it's a tough of one. Reproducible results. They, it exists. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, like uh, it exists. Uh, there's also uh, uh, a journal on Dali on GitHub on for that. Uh, it has, I think, uh, in my memory, that uh, four publication being reviewed at the moment. It, it's 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 just very slow and 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 the. Incentive structure is not there for that, but, but yeah. Uh, I guess the funding agencies can build into the into the funding agencies can build into their grants. That's, so that's what I was suggesting. A reproducible yeah. component, rather than it being a separate grant, which is hard to get off the ground, it's a it's a it's a fundamental component of an original grant. You that, have to have a reproducibility model. That's what I was suggesting that if, before you do your new, your new if, experiment. Yeah. Sorry, if I can add one more thing, then the the, maybe the reviewer process uh, can be also changed in a way that uh, you could you should maybe put your data and your code also along with the manuscript, and then the reviewer just replicate what you've done. And again, here perhaps again the the wrappers or all these these pipeline programs can help a lot because then you can just simplify. Uh, what you want to process, and here we have the, the bits, uh, here we have the boutique, which again, uh, you can just even uh, uh, give a link uh, to, the, to the reviewer and say, okay, here is the way how you can, this is the docker, uh, this is the disk, the connector, this is the data set, and you can just uh, replicate what you have done. And can you that would be a very dedicated reviewer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, that's what I was going to say also, and I think some of the journals are doing that, asking you to, you know, provide the code or the data uh, that will be made available along with the published paper so someone else can you know, check on the results. And so that would be one way to start. But it. if you do it but that way, you might have uh, a, a bigger pool of people who might actually have the time to do it rather than a harassed reviewer.
So it's, and there, there are also there are also papers which allows you to, for example, make comments on on publications, and it will be the post the post publication review. Uh, that will be also one model for it. Yeah, so so uh, reproducibility. I mean, I use the word reproducibility in the in like in the general sense, but it's uh, the, the the problem is like reproducibility, which is I think a tenable. Like you can, if you provide data and code, people can try to you know just rerun that and check whether the things are going well. And it's it's going you know, really tough on the reviewers. Like uh, you know just you know that's why we get errors in the code and because it's just tough to read of someone else and check things. It's just uh, it's just. Uh, but if you're really interested in the result, that's what you would do. Uh, but replicability is another beast, right? If you're like a, you know getting a new data, especially for imaging data, you know getting a new set of uh, 50 subjects or whatever, uh, and that's where the data sharing aspects is so important, and the documentation of the data is so important because then you could think, okay, I can't really you know publish that unless I've run also this thing on this data set that has some common elements that I can sort of uh, uh, generalize or replicate that result on, on those things. And that's where the whole uh, business of uh, documenting, making sure that you can access and find and, and you know, those, uh, the, the, the document of the data and, uh, is, is important. Uh, Brian Chen, you had a question, I think. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I was about to ask the same question, actually, Alan. Um, mentioned but uh, now actually as i'm thinking about something a little bit different okay so the previous question actually i i was about to ask is that how to actually prevent the um uh, using the uh, very limited resource of so this reproducibility test okay from okay the entire process become political and i think uh, alan got an excellent um um, um kind of like an explanation about you know really you know how the funding agency will uh, uh, or maybe related recent, uh, resources would be actually um, 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 used okay for that particular purpose okay however now I get got something actually different okay I think you know after uh, hearing the entire set of talk from all you guys I think this is really excellent so you guys got a lot of very useful tools right so for this particular um, simulation process, you know, a lot of open source tools, right? So I think I have two questions. The first question is technical, is that um, can you, for example, um, reuse some of the tools for, uh, you know, for each other, on each other's platform, okay, for this kind of like reproducibility test, okay, or not? Okay, that's a little bit technical. The second question actually, a little bit kind of like go beyond this is that, can we actually um, imagine some sort of like, you know, automatic uh, testing platform, okay, to be developed in the future that, you know, kind of enforce, you know, any um, uh, author, okay, in this particular domain, particularly, okay, and after they publish something, their result will be automatically run through such kind of like an engine to, you know, to do the automatic, you know, reprodu uh, reproducibility test. Okay, based on certain data sets, they potentially they can also submit. Okay, if that's the case, that could actually really offer a very low cost solution, you know, for the future researcher be able to reuse all the things, right? Because both the source code and the data set actually have been, you know, provided by the authors. Okay, and we only need to develop some sort of infrastructure to make sure such reproducibility, you know, test will be executed again and again and again. Yeah, it certainly seems as though INCF could play a, a, a very important mediating role in bringing these various efforts to the same table to discuss exactly the kind of interoperability that we're being heard pushed here. Yeah, maybe just to comment on that. Uh, I totally agree with you that in the long term, reproducibility studies should be automated. I'm not talking about replication again, but this is definitely this should definitely happen. Uh, today, it's already possible to do this with uh, what's called literate programming. You have tools that can basically re-execute completely a paper, so rebuild the figures uh, embedded in a paper from the actual data. Of course, there is a problem when this takes time. You know, when you when you need a complete computing cluster to do this, then then it would need platforms as 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 you described. But I I definitely agree with you on that. Um, 
Uh, I, I also wanted to add something about uh, the, the funding of uh, these studies. I think if we think more on the methodological aspects of research, then there, there could be some funding angles. Like I could imagine that someone working, for instance, on registration would be interested by first replicating a study and then uh, improving the registration, image re registration part in this study to make it faster, to make it more accurate. And in this, in this case, it would be useful to start from um, a reproduced study. Okay. Hi, uh, I think it's very interesting that we have a, several different models of architecture that we're working on. So, for instance, the BODB and sensory motor DB, I thought it was really interesting that you had a combination of private and public servers. And then when we're looking at the gateways, you have centralized and decentralized gateways. I'm wondering if I can get your comments on how you think we should kind of proceed as a community on that kind of continuum of centralization versus decentralization. So actually, I had a quick comment on the last question. I think, you know, like uh, someone was suggesting um, if you have a result published from one gateway or one tool, you know, uh, do the, reproduce it in another uh, uh, gateway or tool. So I was thinking um, it could be good student projects. It could be education. And if, if, if INCF or someone funds students who will either randomly or, you know, or selectively pick some published results for using one tool or one uh, gateway and then do it on another tool or gateway. Maybe undergraduate student that will, you know, be of interest, interest, generate interest in research ideas and topics which could be part of their meditation. Um, so the reason that we decided to deploy our systems that way for sensory motor DB um, was based on a meeting that we held uh, in San Diego a few years back where we said, all right, let's just try to get neurophysiologists that work on a common system, say, reach and grass system together, and try to come up with a way for them to share data. And we were astonished by the resistance um, that some of these groups had to share any of their data. Um, and so in at least a lot of the systems we've seen today are involved in human brain imaging, and it seems like people there are more willing to share uh, but at least in monkey neurophysiology, you know, you train this animal for a year or two just to do the task and then spend another year recording and they just don't want to let it go. And so our sort of compromise was to say, okay, well, we, we'll make the system useful to you to organize and run your own analyses. And then that sort of lowers the barrier or the, the entry barrier to then sharing it on a, on a common system. Can I just comment on the uh, reproducibility and replication aspect of the... And publication aspect. I think uh, eventually uh, you know, the good journals will, uh, will, will ask for uh, as, as far as possible a possible uh, paper, which, which texts, uh, um, I mean, I've, I've seen a couple of those. So there's Michael Baxon, uh, a neuron paper that was entirely reproducible. You can, can download the data, reproduce the figures, and so on. And uh, I don't know. I mean, it is really good, so I don't know, it probably didn't take him that much time to do it, but uh, I think it's at least a factor of two, maybe, uh, for, you know, it depends it depends how technical are the people, but it, it can be, it can take like a three or four times, or maybe five times more longer to write that thing, rather than just the paper, and, and throw away the things. But the user, reusability of it, uh, the funding agency can say, hey, uh, you know, when you're going to publish a paper, we want you to publish in uh, a reproducible, uh, you know, uh, with the tag of a reproducibility. Uh, and that, that also is, a, is, is an aspect of, um, you know, putting it on the, on the publishing aspect rather than the, uh, uh, the, the current aspect is, is, is a possibility. Um. Any last questions? Stephen? There's a sense in which we are all talking amongst the converted here, and might there's a sense in which we're all talking amongst the converted, and what I wonder about is how we're going to get this out to cognitive neuroscientists who publish massively more in my field neuroimaging than any of those of us that are worried about methodologies do. So there's a massive education problem here. I mean, if I go to them and say, oh yeah, here's three new tools which I'd like you to learn. They're already struggling with FSL, SPM, and Daphne. And they go to their two week course somewhere, and then they spend a year getting really familiar with it, and they're going to resist like nothing on earth 
having to learn yet another set of tools or even swapping. So how are you going to break through that barrier? I think that's a huge it's, hurdle. It's, it's a very good question. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, and the question I have in my mind, like almost uh, always, like how do you uh, make sure that some, some people, like, uh, because the effect uh, and now, the incentive is very small. It's a, like, a, you know, you, you actually, it's, it's a counter incentive at the moment because it takes you time uh, it doesn't add on your CV because the, uh, the publication list is the most uh, important thing on your CV at the moment. So it's, it's actually, our system is actually preventing us and, and the students and to learn those things and to, and, and to do it. So, uh, so I think my answer to that is uh, that really the, the funding agencies have a, a true responsibility with that, in that respect. Uh, they, they really have to enforce that your research is reusable and reproducible. Or replicable, whatever. Uh, you know, it, it's that, that's there. That's there because because that's the public money. So we, we have a say in you know like uh, if you're paying taxes, if you are you know getting NIH to fund research, you have a say in in you know in, in that uh, you know that research should not be you know for away. Uh, so so I think I think that's that's the that's my angle of it. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, and if you're a scientist, you know like you 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 really want to get the answers. And if you really want to get the answers, you know that you have to get, uh, you know, the, uh, there are other possible ways, like uh, I know like uh, a new uh, you know, is, uh, uh, is, is doing more like a you know, public site where, okay, this, uh, these people have shared their data, these are not, have not, and they, and they get, you know, it's a bit of like a, <laughs> almost like a shame thing, like, you know, uh, which I don't like, but, uh, but you know, it, they have some, Success in you know getting the data out. <coughs> I think the, one of the key uh, community would be the, the clinical community. That's going to be really tough, and that's where you know top down approach may may have to do. And they, they certainly don't have time. They certainly don't have the money, and they they have the most uh, incredible and, and useful data uh, for your science. Uh, so that's, uh, that's that would be a tough one. I would add that. Um the uh, importance of this issue is, is growing all the time. We all saw what happened with the PNAS paper by Eklund that uh, gave everybody in the imaging community a, a black eye for a while, and there had to be a, a very robust response to put it in context. It was overdone, but we had to push back against that for a long time to, to, to say it's not anything like as bad as it's being portrayed or perceived by that article. Well, it's up to us to, uh, to do our due diligence before it gets to that point. And so the kinds of issues that we're discussing here in terms of reproducibility and replication are becoming ever more important as data is analyzed faster and faster and faster. So Just maybe a comment to add to that. Uh, I think integrated web platforms and gateways also have a, a say to, to this problem. Uh, I think we are at the point now that uh, running an analysis on your own laptop with FSL might be more complicated than going, for instance, to Seabrain and just click around and launch your analysis. Uh, these integrated platforms should, I think we are close to the point where uh, we could export things from these platforms to help reproducibility. Like we could imagine a button saying, you know, get me the reproducibility link, and then from this link, pe external people could download the data, get access to the tools, and actually reproduce the analysis. It's already possible in uh, SPM and I think some FSL tools to export provenance in NIDM format at no cost. You just click a button and then you have the NIDM provenance that you can then stick in a paper. So I think I integrating things in platforms may make things easier. I have a comment um, to kind of um, facilitate Ellen's um, comments as well. I mean, I think the, the big picture, if you think back 30 years to the beginning of neuroimaging and the use of data, that the computer scientists that were embedded with the neuroscientists built the initial platforms, and Ellen was certainly one of the leaders in that. And as an end user, as a neuroscientist, Finding the tools in order to test a question became kind of a very stepwise process. What's happened now, neuroscience is actually thinking kind of Manhattan Project kind of vision. And individual scientists have much less traction. 
And so what neuroscientists must do is figure out how to fit into a model that's bigger than any one individual, which is something that, to me, the computer science world and the informatics world already realizes. And we're at this period of dissynchrony in this communication. So we're being attacked by questions and data that doesn't appear reproducible when people aren't even doing the same experiment over and over again. So I would just argue, and I'm certainly going to talk about this a little bit tomorrow, but how does one create a platform where the teams are together and what will drive this is big neuroscience questions where everyone agrees that they all contribute to a bigger community. I think you guys have already done that. I think the neuroscience world is figuring out how to do that when it's not incentivized well in terms of how you get a paper out, how you get promoted. Whereas if you're the Allen Institute, they go, come work for us. We have a big mission. You're all on board. And, and that incentivizes how everyone plans these things differently. And I think we have to figure out how to communicate that. And I think it's just a process. I think the, the slide that you know, what the second talk had about you know, what's going to be 2020 to 2050 is where it is, but there's going to be a lot of casualties of science as it's done now along the way. We've got to figure out how to anticipate that. I mean, one of the difficulties is that not every neuroscience question uh, falls in that you know, framework. Like for the genetic stuff, for instance, if you have the genome to sequence and you can sort of cut the genome and then and push them every little bit to uh, like a different lab, that's, that's a perfect, you know, like a you know, community uh, process, right? But the, uh, not, I mean, what are the questions that uh, fall in that uh, category uh, in neuroscience? That's, it's not entirely clear. It's, it's a difficult uh, uh, business. So, so to me, it's more like a, how do we communicate uh, the results uh, such that machines and, and then like, uh, how, what's, what is our job such that such a, and so those questions can emerge? And that's that's a more like the, uh, on this side. Okay, one last question, I think, uh, Georgia. Just a quick clarification, since Neuromorpho was mentioned. Uh, we, we do post the result of uh, data requests, but there is no shaming whatsoever. It's just a matter of transparency, so you know whether people yeah. like it or not is obviously a matter of opinion. Uh, but we do request data, and whether the data is then shared or or not, we post the information whether it is available or not. And I think right. that's part of the responsibility of data curators. No, absolutely. Uh, sorry, I didn't want to say that you were shaming at all. That, that was just not, not my, uh, my point. But uh, I wanted to say that uh, when you started to put this thing, the transparency aspect, uh, I think there's, I mean, maybe shaming is not the right word. I don't know how to say it. But the people felt that they had to, uh, to I mean, you, you yourself said that you had more uh, people responding to, to, you know, when that happened. Uh, if I remember the, the paper, and uh, I was one of the reviewers of that paper, and so I was asking, okay, so, so is that a little bit of a shame? And, you know, it's, it's just like, a, we have to be careful not to do the shaming. I, don't, I, think, I think that's what you're saying, you know, perfect right. And, uh, yeah. but, uh, but I like, I really like the transparency aspect. Uh, uh, I think it's also like a, uh, uh, almost like a, an indication aspect. If you're a scientist, that's the normal thing to do. Uh, and you know that that eventually maybe will change in the future if we, you know, sort of put in the education aspect. I don't know how much uh, of those sort of things are actually taught at, at universities. You know, okay, what are the basic principles of being a scientist? You know, what's what what is your job when you're trying to do science? When you're trying to be a scientist? I think that's a, that's a different question. Right. I think at that point it's a good point to stop. Um, I'd like to thank the speakers for a very in interesting discussion. We'll break up now for uh, uh, 55 minutes, reconvene in, in parallel sessions at 1.30. Thank you very much, everybody.